Greetings, darklings, from across the interweb. It is once again I, Precious Cam the Duchess. And we are here for the Sounds and Shadows uh, podcast once again. I have, this is like a double Sounds and Shadows, uh, because I am going to be interviewing fellow Sounds and Shadows member, uh, group admin, um, and writer, uh, Hyde Tepes from the band, well, God, from a lot of bands. Carrion, uh, you know, Dove Tribe, uh, Misfit Toys, uh, just a lot of bands. Adrian, hello and good morning. Hello. Or it might be the middle of the night for you. It's, it's 9.05 p.m. <laughs> That's fair. Well, it's morning for me. Um, <laughs> First off, today's show is brought to you, I like giving a shout out now of the t-shirts I'm wearing for it, of uh, Dream Into Dust, a awesome band that, man, has some of the most interesting merch I've ever seen for a band. So I think th that's why I want to wear this one. I think that ties well with you, Hyde, is because you do that as well. Um, and then also brought to us by, can you please hold up your mug? Yes. Yes, my mug. Hi, tell us why this mug is glorious and important and a little bit about the artist who made it. Well, it's glorious and important because first of all, it is one of two mugs that I own. Ooh, that is, that does, that's a rare commodity then. Yeah, I know. Uh, and the artist is also responsible for me, which is, you know, her masterpiece. Uh, <laughs> my mother made this. Happy Mother's Day! That it's really cool. Can you hold it up near the camera there too? Let yeah. everybody see. We will post a link to uh, Adria uh, Hyde's mom's um, artwork that you can get on little uh, mugs and doodads and whatnot. This is great. Yeah, it's a Facebook page and you know all that. Wonderful. All that stuff. I'm really excited for this. Um, I want to get started giving you a chance to talk a little bit. Let's start out with your musical history. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're in quite a few projects. So if you can kind of go through and say some of the projects you did leading up to what we're going to talk about today, which is Dove Tribe. <clears throat> uh, yeah, well, you know, there's the ones that you mentioned. There's Carrion and Misfit Toys, uh, which I suppose have been the main ones. Uh, there's uh, of course been like a couple little things here and there. Uh, I do some uh, solo work with uh, modular synths. I do some sound design type of stuff. Uh, yeah, so that's what I do. <laughs> yes, and and so now you you have the new project uh, Dove Tribe that you are just pouring out EPs for at a rate that I can barely keep up with. Um, which is something it seems like is always going on with you. You're, you're somebody who's always pushing boundaries and producing new things all the time. It seems out of, out of a lot of the musicians I know, you're just in constant motion uh, when it comes to the projects you're putting out and the sounds you're putting out. Um, you spoke a little bit about modular uh, synths and that's a big part of it. And in general, just kind of the DIY idea. What attracts you so much to that kind of taking a hands-on physical approach to the sounds that you're making? Um, well, I think just in general, it probably comes from when I started my first few bands when I was like 13. It was, you know, it was the usual like shitty little three chord punk bands. Sure, I've been there. That I was into, you know, I was listening to like basically just rock based music. Mm -hmm. uh, which that's a scene where there is that emphasis on playing the instrument and that it is more physical. And so with something like modular, that's kind of taking that one step further because what a modular synth really is, is, you know, it's a custom made instrument where you choose every single part of it and through doing so you can really shape the sound into that you do get your own sound more so than just a, a regular hardware synth or uh, plugins or whatever it might be. 
Yeah, I, I think to me that's one of the things that always uh, interested me and attracted me to your music is that's just it. It does feel like kind of even every album is like a live recording because you're right. You're There's tiny little modulations and tiny little things happening. So it's not just, as you said, Amaranth uses this plug-in that, you know, Colin likes to use for a guitar sound effect or something. And you can kind of hear that from song to song for us that it, it comes through. But every single thing you do is a little bit different, a little bit, for, you're really never kind of getting the exact same pinpoint sound song to song um, because of these little changes that you do. Yeah, and you know, another thing about that is like with a modular synth, you're not, you're not able to save anything. Right. So, you know, I could have something going and just twisting one button or, you know, switching out one cable can completely change the whole thing. So the reason why things might sound, I guess, live is that that's how it's recorded. Right. And it's recorded in a way where you, you have to record it now because you're most likely, depending on how complicated a patch is, of course, but most likely you're not going to be able to fully recreate it. So it is a now or never type of scenario. I, I so love that. It's, it's almost kind of like a, a painting, like you don't do prints of this or something. You know, yeah, you're recording it in, but that's kind of, that chain of sounds is a one of a kind on every song that you're doing. Yeah. Very cool. Um, another thing I kind of wanted to brush into is you you mentioned kind of all these projects that you've had some of which you know for over in florida some of which are back you know you're in norway now but you know you have you've traveled a lot around and seen a lot tell me a little bit about kind of what what brought about you know you seeing all these different areas and lenses and viewpoints and cultures well like traveling around the world <laughs> yes, yes, but you um like your family, for example, are in different parts of the of the world at, at different times, right? Well, yeah, uh, my mom's Norwegian, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. My dad is Kurdish, which is basically it go it's it's a country that doesn't exist, I suppose, you know, officially. But it, if it did exist, it would be made up of uh, parts of Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. Uh, so the Kurdish people is one of, if not the biggest, um, ethnic group without their own independent uh, state or country or anything like that. And so because of that, be having been a thing for sure god knows how long you know hundreds of years if not thousands uh, as a very natural result they they're, they're get they're getting spread around all over the world so i apparently have family members in anywhere from well obviously the middle east and and, and norway but also there's supposedly a couple in uh france and fucking canada there's probably some in Germany, just because of the fact that, for whatever reason, a lot of Kurdish uh, refugees end up in Germany or, or Sweden or Norway. Yeah. I, I remember that uh, when I was in Berlin, um, very much so. I, it, and it kind of has just become like an ingrained part of the culture there, which is really interesting, kind of the blending that goes on in Berlin. Um, so no, I, I think that's really interesting and I think it goes to your story as a whole a lot and how your music comes together, which is really cool. Um, I, I felt like a little bit when I heard the newest uh, All in the Waiting um, Dove Tribe uh, EP that just came out, um, a, a more political f edge to it than in some of your more uh, textural pieces that you've done, in particular the song uh, New Cold War. Can you kind of talk to me a little bit about, I don't know, the mindset that went into that and uh, what was the the impetus behind that song and that EP? I mean, the mindset of, I guess, the EP as a whole, but 
but specifically that song is uh, some people might call it pessimistic, but if you look at the world, then I would just say that it's realism. Right. It's a bit of a 1984 type of scenario, which is a book that I have actually read. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And um, it's just the idea, you know, in 1984, it's like you, you always have a war. And the enemy right. changes, but there's always a war. And it does kind of s seem like that's the case here as well. Uh, that song was written uh, right as I heard about, you know, the U.S. pulling out of Afghanistan where they right. have been for 20, 20 years or something. Yeah. To, to what? Get back at Afghanistan for 9-11? For, for it's right. not like the entire fucking country of Afghanistan was responsible for that, you fucking idiots. Like, but, you know, yeah, sure, go ahead and kill, like, X amount of fucking completely innocent civilians over a couple thousand lives in 9-11. And it's not to say that 9-11 wasn't, you know, a tragedy or anything. Right, right. But it's just, it's, it's that thing where, you know, in America, black people are supposed to be fucking forget about what slavery where way more people died in slavery or native american genocides or what is really the genocide of uh middle eastern people by america than any than any uh, 9-11 victims sure no I, I think that that's something that we're definitely as a country looking at now and, and seeing the impact of just how long we've been involved in some of these foreign wars. And I think it's something come, coming up. Uh, I think Desert Storm in particular was one where after the fact, I mean, at the time there was, I, America was really hurt. You know what I mean? The fact that this happened and so many people were hurt in New York and killed and it, it hit us on an emotional level. And you're right, like the support for that politically at the time was everyone was like, we need to get someone. I don't know. I'm mad. I'm, I'm hurt by this, you know, and I think that was a big sentiment throughout the states. And then 20 years later, you're right, looking back and kind of the information came up and were there actually weapons of mass destruction and kind of all the questions they ask after the fact, it gave a chance for people to say, was this the appropriate response to your point or even the right people that we were focusing that anger on and and for it to go on so long and be so costly and involved and entwined in other places around the world um it is it's i a tough thing at least for me as an american to kind of put my head around both of those things at the same time, believing in and loving my country and appreciate, but at the same time, some of the things that just get done that we don't really even understand why we went to a place or did it. Yeah, and you know, it's not like I'm, I'm not against the idea of revenge. Sure. But the thing is, you know, however many children for example, in Afghanistan, that's been bombed to fucking pieces in America's stupid fucking little like revenge mission. They had nothing to do with it. Right. They probably weren't even born. So if you want vengeance, that's fucking fine. Go right ahead. I'm not going to stop you, but direct your vengeance towards the people who deserve it. Sure. And the entire country of Afghanistan or any Middle Eastern country or whatever it might be aren't responsible for that because if that was the case then that would be like me holding you responsible for everything that the american army and american government has done to quite literally kill my family just purely because you're american and that wouldn't be fair would it right no i you're so, you're dead on right and there are a lot of things I, that i should be held personally responsible for but that 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 isn't one. That's not, that's not one of them. But there are a lot of them you should be mad at me about specifically. I think. Yeah. I'm sure there is. We'll find something. Um, okay. So next up, um, I want you to tell me a little bit about how you've been keeping yourself sane because you're living uh, in Norway now, kind of out in the outskirts, in a very rural place, right? I mean, it's pretty spaced out. Um, 
so you've been dealing with kind of that isolation for a while, even before um, things happened with the global pandemic. And what are you doing to kind of keep yourself sane and working on different activities and whatnot uh, during this time when it's just really hard, like you said, to see anybody? Well, you know, my life hasn't changed at all. <laughs> this, I was built for this, man. Uh, but, you know, the thing is, I, you know, willingly moved out here. Mm -hmm. And I'm just not a very social person. So I, if, if I didn't have Wi-Fi, I probably wouldn't have known that anything's going on in the first place because I didn't, you know, for most people, they, they're used to, you know, you get up, you go to work, you send your kids to school, and then you go to, to a bar or something at the weekend. But I've never done that in the first place. I don't have children. I don't have like a traditional job. And as I said, I'm not social, so I don't really go to the bar or anything like that. So yeah. I haven't lost anything really. Like, uh, you know, what I'm doing now in 2021 is the exact same thing I was doing in 2018, which is I stay inside, keep to myself, and I make music. So it hasn't really changed that much. I guess the only thing that's changed is, you know, if I go somewhere, I'll wear a mask and, you know, there's a like a little anti-back thing at the entrance at the store, but that's pretty much it. Yeah. Well, that makes me feel a little better because I know I always have a hard time when you send me every other week. You're just like, Ken, I wrote a new six song EP. Here it is. Yeah. Hey, Ken. And I'm just like, what? I was like, if I get a song done this month, I'm doing well. Good God. How do you, but that's why you're just always doing music uh, 24 seven all the time. It feels like. Well, yeah, because I am. Uh, I don't, you know, uh, I, I don't have any hobbies, I guess you could say. It's, it's not like I wake up and then I play video games for five hours and then I go to music for like two hours. I don't have to waste eight hours of my day at work or anything like that. So I wake up whenever the fuck I want. It's, you know what my sleep schedule is like, and it's erratic as fuck. You but, have the same you know, one, even though we're six yeah. hours apart. That's what's messed up. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It's terrible. But, but. Um, So, you know, I, I wake up and I get started on working on whatever it is I'm working on. You know, I have breakfast, which is coffee and a cigarette, and then I just go do stuff <laughs> and do that for however long. And... It, you know, it's just, it's what I do. Yeah. Uh, it's, first of all, by now I'm used to it. But secondly, it's also just that I have never had any other interest. And But you don't even have a TV, do you? No, I don't have a TV. <laughs> that, you know, well, I mean, that's pretty different from, you know, what we have in America here too. Although I think there's a lot of people here that do that and just plug out from it, but you just, there's nothing uh, on there to interest you, right? You'd just rather be zeroed in on making new art. Yeah, and you know, if I want to watch something, I can just watch it online, but the things that I would watch is most likely not going to be on TV anyway. Like, right. I watch a lot of, um, uh, I watch a lot of, like, 1920s silent movies and that kind of thing, uh, and I've never seen that on TV, so why do I need a TV then? True. Yeah. Um, if you're not showing Nosferatu on TV, then I'll fucking watch a TV. I mean, that is a classic. Um, another thing I, I wanted you to kind of share with our viewers that, you know, they get a chance for your voice. And I want to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, writing or other bands in a minute, but you do so much interesting stuff in terms of DIY, everything you do, you're putting together yourself for your physical recordings, whether it's the tape cassettes or, um, you know, art pieces or anything to go with it. Tell me a little bit about how you link together what the art piece for a album or a new EP is going to look like to what the music is. How do you kind of join that in your head and then figure out a way to bring it to life? Well, you know, some, sometimes it might be 
more abstract and sometimes it might be a little more obvious, but I always want the art to in some way represent the music. Um, and since I made the music, I know that music better than anyone else. So it also makes sense that I would be the one who makes the art for it rather than paying some random guy who might make something great and might have all the talent and skill in the world for that kind of thing, but wouldn't have the same relationship to the music that I have because he or she didn't make it. Right. So uh, there's that. And then it's just the fact that uh, I, I just like doing all of it. Like I put just as much importance on, on, on the music itself on the artwork or lyrics or you know the whole presentation of the thing it's not just like it's not like i'm just focusing on the music and then the art is a second thought or anything like that right no and and i think a lot of the themes too on the art is just i always really like it's just such cool striking imagery like this new uh cover for the dove tribe all in the waiting um, album. Can you tell me a little bit about, it's just such a neat, almost, I don't know, like uh, Indian Shiva kind of feeling. And then the, the swords, the candles, all of it. Can you talk through a little bit about how this image came together and what elements you drew for it? I think the main image, uh, like the bigger one, I guess, mm -hmm. is, uh, I think that's, just some picture I found of uh, of the Virgin Mary, uh -huh. uh, and then uh, on the I think it would be on the left side of her head, you have this little symbol which is uh, a design from uh, it's called Dick, which is uh, basically an ancient Kurdish form of tattooing, uh -huh. uh, and that's one of the symbols that they might. Uh, get tattooed um, sure. it's it's kind of one of those things where it's a dying art because you know the world is becoming more modernized and secular and things like that and mm -hmm. but so Kurdish tattooing wasn't just about oh this looks cool right. it was it, it usually had some kind of um, function to it uh, for example uh, you might get certain symbols tattooed for preventing headaches or something like that like it might have that kind of a function to it yeah. or it might have more of a uh, a more spiritual thing to it sure uh so i just wanted to like i've always liked basically catholic imagery mm -hmm. I mean, you know we're in this fucking scene we all like catholic imagery that shouldn't need to be explained that much but I, so you know, Patrick yeah, is cool. there's a little bit of that, but I also wanted to make it a little bit more personal. Yeah. So, you know, I added the, um, uh, that tattoo thing. Mm -hmm. uh, then on top, you have uh, a skull, which is supposed to be a dove skull. Yeah. But I, whether it, you know, I don't know if it's anatomically correct, because I haven't seen a dove skull. Right. But, um, you know, so, so the dove skull could be seen in a way where, um, doves traditionally, uh, as a symbolic thing, usually, uh, is related to, for example, salvation or freedom or a clean slate and well, sure. yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. You know, I, I think that leads in well, uh, so you, you recently kind of did this, I don't know, name change, I'm not name change, because you're still doing uh, carry in and, but what kind of uh, led you to this particular name in starting this new project? Dove Tribe? Yeah. So it sort of goes back to, to, I guess, the beginnings of carry in and I don't remember why I call that band Carrion, but uh, what I do remember, or generally know, because I know the English language, so I know, you know, Carrion, Carrion birds, that kind of thing, you know, vultures or whatever, and then... Ravens, all that, you know, yeah, like yeah. picking, picking 
corpses of the dead for your sustenance. Yeah, pretty much. And then uh, I, for, for a while, I did a different project called Swan Sect. Yeah. And now when I named it that, I wasn't thinking so much about anything. But then I went through this period over the past couple months, I guess, of just diving a little bit deeper into psychology and specifically the Jungian kind of psychology, looking mm -hmm. at archetypes and symbolism and, you know, all of that type of stuff. And through doing so, discovering or, or just becoming aware of this tendency to, you know, Carrion is often presented as a cult. And then you have swan sect. Well, there's the bird thing, you know, the swan, sure. the sect, and then you have the same type of thing with uh, with dove tribe. And it's true. I never thought about yeah. that before, but you're right. They kind of all do follow a pattern there. Yeah, and so you know, becoming aware of that pattern, and just when the name dove tribe came to me, I didn't, I wasn't aware of it yet. But when I decided that that's the name that I would be using for this thing then by that time I, I had started becoming aware of it and kind of thinking of you know why am I always using these symbols like these words like why am I using these words that are so heavily associated with with symbolism and uh, you know it's a, it's not like it's a thought that I'm finished with mm -hmm. It's, a, it's just a continuous thing that I'll probably keep peeling off the layers for, for years and years. But, you know, when I think of birds, for example, just birds in general, I think of, well, they can fly. There's that sense of freedom in that. Sure. And sure. when I think of things like cults or sects or tribes, I, so I suppose specifically the words cults and sects might bring about like negative connotations, but when I think of those type of things, I think more about, you know, a group of people who are coming together over shared values of some kind, not necessarily uh, religious or spiritual, but, you know, there's just, they have something in common and that's what brings them together to create this, uh, this bond. Uh, sure. And then a unified vision. And, and I think kind of going with what you're saying, yeah, there's a, maybe a negative connotation with, say, like a sect or a cult, but also what it usually says is it's a counterculture. You know what I mean? Like there's kind of the big community and a sect or a cult or a tiny bubble of like-minded people that share a value. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, uh, looking through uh, Kurdish history, for example, the Kurdish people do have tribes. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily in the same way that Native Americans do. Sure. Uh, and it's most likely, it's, it's not something that has much of, has any kind of effect these days. But historically, the Kurdish people have belonged to tribes and, you know, that, kind of, that type of thing. So there is the personal element to it. Uh, the place where I grew up was um, kind of a weird place. It's... Uh, like 20 minutes from where supposedly where Christianity first arrived when it came to Norway. Yeah. And, you know, what in my younger days, I used to describe it as uh, it's a stain that just don't go away, which, you know, you're, you're like 13 and you're mad about God or whatever. Right, right. But, but I Having remember music and yeah. Yeah. You know, but I remember uh, we have these little, um, I never know what to call them in English because I don't think you really have them. So I just call them prayer houses. And it's basically these little houses where, you know, they'll have like Bible meetings and little things like that. Sure. And in the place where I grew up, they all belonged to what is essentially a sect. Like it's not necessarily that they're like doing anything bad. It's just, you know, it, it belongs to a group that comes together based on their interpretation of, of Christianity. And it's not always a bad thing. I mean, some of them, for example, don't baptize children, but wait until they are, 
I think either 15 or 18 so that they yeah. can decide for themselves. Old enough to grasp and consent yeah. to. Right. You know, it's not that it's ne necessarily always a negative thing, even if I myself didn't always have the greatest experiences with all sure. of them. But so, you know, that sect and cult thing is just something that has been in my life and then starting to look more into my own heritage and ancestry, discovering similar things there as well on that side of the family. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, I don't use these words or, or terms in the way that I imagine a lot of people in this scene might use them, which sure. is, they sound good. And yeah, they sound good. It looks cool, sounds interesting and whatever. Uh, and that's fine. If, if you use it for, for that purpose, then, you know, you do you for whatever reasons you have for doing that. Sure. It's just that I do have a more personal reason for choosing words. I don't tend to do something just because I feel like it. There is right. always somehow some kind of deeper meaning to it. There's, there's intent in all of it. Yeah. yeah no, right. I, I like that. And I think going through that too then, okay, so the, the name changing over, um, but in addition to that, the sound of Dub Tribe is very different because to me, it's my favorite. I've really enjoyed all of your music and get a chance to kind of hear it on the fly all the time. And yeah. this is my favorite project or thing that you've done because it has rock elements. And I think that's a thing where you, you do get pegged a little for your soundscaping and using modular synths and doing something very atmospheric and that gets associated with you. But you have a lot of rock metal roots to you too. And I, 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 even American stuff, like, you know, when we'll talk about Motley Crue or, or anything like that. And I hear that flavor in this new EP a lot and in the music you're doing going forward in a way you haven't before by adding in guitars, so on and so forth. Tell me about kind of how this difference in sound is happening on the new project. Well, you know, when I, uh, as I was saying, the first few bands that I started was uh, very guitar based, rock based, mm -hmm. you know, kind of punk kind of stuff. Uh, when I, when, when I grew up, that's the music I was growing up with. Uh, I don't know if my memories of this are real or imagined because I was just so young. Sure. But I do know for a fact that when I was three years old, maybe around there, uh, and it was just me and my mom, uh, my dad left because that's what dads do, I guess. But, you know, we had this um, VHS tape and it was, I think it was either a collection of uh, music videos by the doors or it was a live performance. Live, I was yeah. going to say live DVD, but you know, it's not a DVD. Live VHS tape, I guess. So uh, what I've been told by my mom is uh, she would put that on and just put me in my chair and I would just watch that and I guess sometimes fall asleep to it. So, you know, that type of music has just always been around. Uh, I remember being like, 10 years old and my mom's in another room painting at night listening to Winds of Change by Scorpions or yeah. you know being at my grandmother's house and borrowing her Walkman and going through her CD collection and my grandmother's CD collection isn't what you would expect it's like appetite for destruction there's a bunch of Bon Jovi you know there's like rock music and a lot of it is uh, from the 80s so that type of music was just always around me. And when I started discovering music on my own, which I did when I was, I don't know, 11, 12, maybe, the bands that I would find were stuff like Kiss and ACDC and, you know, that like the basic rock experience, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, finding stuff like Black Flag and, and Misfits and all that type of stuff. So when I, I guess, started to have the idea of starting a band, it was always that. It was always that I wanted to be in some kind of a rock band. So I always tried starting that kind of band, but this would be in like 2008, 2009. And 
at that time, the big thing, I guess, of rock-based music was like pop punk, like Blink-182, or right. it would be like the whole metalcore thing. And I kind of got lumped into that crowd, uh, not because I listened to the music so much, but because I was looking at pictures of Motley Crue from 1983, like the Shout at the Devil era. Yeah. And I was seeing someone like Nikki Six with big hair and makeup, and I was emulating that. And then I go, I go to school looking like that, and, and I'm like, what the fuck is this emo thing you're talking about? I'm fucking glam rock. And then I find all this, like, you know, all, all the metalcore pop punk stuff and kind of tried getting into it really just because, I don't know. I, it's what was there. It, sure. People made it look like I was supposed to be into that, but I wasn't. And I tried and I couldn't get into it. But the first few bands that I started, the people I started those bands with, that's what they were into. So that was always a bit of a struggle where I was into, you know, Motley Crue and Misfits and, you know, maybe they had heard of them, but it wasn't something that they really listened to. So we kind of came from different worlds where they wanted to play, you know, Simple Plan. I remember we covered a song by Simple Plan called uh, Addicted or something. And the song is just fucking burned into my brain forever. Because you played it so much, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. We were a terrible band, and this would be like my very first band or something. So we, you know, I was kind of like, okay, well, I want to play Misfits covers or or Motley Crue, but I guess I'm outnumbered, so we're just going to play this fucking song then. Cool, whatever. All right, so we're coming up to the end here. I want you to leave everybody. I, th I think this has been great, and I feel like, it's been a chance for our viewers to get to know you uh, on a level that, that I get to all the time. So, so I think that's exciting. Tell me what you're excited for as things start to open back up slowly in the world, things start to um, come back to some seeming of normalcy. With these new EPs coming up, what are you going to be excited for uh, in 2022? Well, <clears throat> My girlfriend lives in Florida, so it'd be pretty fucking nice if I could, you know, go hang out with her. Yeah, uh, say hi. She's lovely. We love her. I follow her on Instagram. <laughs> That's good. So, you know, it, it would be that. Uh, of course, you know, if I'd be back in Florida, I'd also be able to uh, get back to just something as fucking stupid as having rehearsals with uh, Misfit Toys, for example. Yeah. Of course, playing shows and... And, and with Dove Tribe, I would want to, to play some shows, uh, which all of those, everything that I do that would have anything to do with live stuff is most likely going to be happening in America. Sure. So I do kind of depend on that this stuff is taken care of so that I'm able to do, to, to basically just fucking leave the country. Uh, you should just move are, to Kalamazoo. You should just move back to Kalamazoo. You can come hang out with us, use the studio. We can get weird. Just come to Kalamazoo. I'll wow. feed you. Oh, really? Sure, I'll, I'll adopt you. you. I'll, yeah. Okay, dad. <laughs> well, you know, it is Mother's Day. It, it is, it is. I'm excited for that. I'm about to, as soon as we're done with this interview, I'll call my mom. We've already plugged for your mom and her beautiful artwork and, and coffee mugs. Um, um, yeah, let's see what else. Uh, uh, oh yeah, we are working on uh, we are working on a new Carrion album, mm. but uh, you know things kind of got moved around a little bit. We were supposed to release the first single this month, actually, but I don't know. You know, shit happens sometimes. But it yeah. is coming and it is being worked on. We're also working with uh, there's a UK based. Uh, studio called the uh, Sinistar Studios. Uh -huh. doing a music video for us that's being worked on right now. I I have finished the second Dub Tribe EP. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I just <laughs> we just uh, released the first one like yesterday and boom, you already finished another one. Yeah, and I'm about to start working on the third one too. So there's gonna be a steady stream of music from whatever projects I'm involved with. I'm always, you know, talking to people about collaborations or remixes and things. So, so you know, there's going to be 
stuff, even if, if, even if I can't go out of the country and play a show, like there's at least going to be a continuous stream of new music to keep people excited while waiting. Perfect. Well, let's give a spin to my favorite track off uh, All in the Waiting right now, New Cold War. And we're going to listen to that as we come out. As always, everybody, give your mom a hug and keep it fucking dark, yeah. <laughs>